for us. It is a pleasure to have today a real expert in the field, which is uh, Coralia Cartis. Coralia is an associate professor in numerical optimization in the Math Institute in Oxford, and also a Turing fellow at the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science. She holds a PhD degree from Cambridge University. Uh, she was supervised by one of the big old names in the optimization field, such as uh, Mike Powell. And before uh, her position in Oxford, he also, she also had a position in Edinburgh. Um, if you have a look at, uh, at her impressive CV, you, you, you will see uh, very, very impressive uh, publications in most uh, optimization journals, in top optimization journals, in fact. And uh, her research uh, deals with uh, nonlinear optimization algorithm analysis, taking into account especially complexity. Because in data science, as I said, you need algorithms, but you don't need any type of algorithm. You need algorithms which are numerically stable, but especially which are fast. And uh, complexity and uh, analyzing the, the, the speed of convergence of such algorithms is uh, something in which uh, our guest now uh, has, uh, has made a lot of uh, impressive uh, progress. So, uh, Coralia, it would have been a real pleasure that you would, were here with uh, joining with us in this, uh, in this event, but uh, we know that these are very hard times for mobility, especially when one has to, to cross the, the borders from outside the European Union to the European Union in particular. So, but anyway, we have the we, we are very happy to, to have you here and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emilio and uh, all the organizers for this uh, wonderful invitation. And I sincerely apologize again for my uh, physical absence there. Um, and uh, it is a great pity for me not to be able to, to be there. But I am uh, very uh, grateful for this uh, opportunity and I hope this pandemic is over so we can see uh, each other soon, so we can see each other face to face on some other uh, occasion. And I uh, thank you again for, for uh, all this opportunity. Um, so uh, today I will try to talk about um, how machine learning applications have driven new optimization research, new optimization algorithms, new optimization developments. And the talk today, the work in it is uh, joint with my postdocs, uh, Yari Fox and Estelle Massar, and my PhD students, Adileto Temisov, Alex Puyu, and uh, Zen Shao. So what I will talk about Oops. I'm sorry, it worked a moment ago. Okay. So, um, optimization in uh, machine learning, I will try to tell you about um, the use of optimization in training uh, machine learning uh, uh, deep in forming deep nets. And I will use this as a motivation for developing new mathematics and new optimization research. Um, I will talk in particular about the challenge that comes from the scale of this problem and how we use techniques from other areas to tackle it. So for example, I will talk about sketching uh, as a useful tool from randomized numerical linear algebra to allow us to do a dimensionality reduction, uh, especially in the parameter space. And uh, from that point of view, I will talk about improvements for local optimization algorithms, but also I will look at global optimization and some of the suitable landscapes, um, uh, some of the suitable landscapes where some of these approaches work particularly well. Um, Overall, I will um, show the benefits of what we know essentially from classical optimization, that adaptivity in algorithm parameters helps, curvature helps, um, and essentially how to reduce the dimensionality in the parameter space. That's also helpful for developing new algorithms. Throughout this talk, I will start from applications, but then because I'm a mathematician, 
I will abstract it and look at the underlying mathematical structure and problem and try to develop something that is more general than just for this particular application. So in particular, now I just want to talk about for a little bit things that you may know at this point, at this late point in the uh, conference about training, uh, deep uh, training, training um, in uh, um, various machine learning uh, systems. So if we talk about supervised learning problems, we know that in binary classification, for example, we want to find a separating hyperplane that allows us to classify uh, two sets of points um, to separate them. Um, and in particular, we are given a, an input, uh, input data U, and we want to associate to each point a label. So essentially minus one if it's on one side of the hyperplane and one on the other. And from a class of models, we will choose, or predictors, we will choose uh, the best one uh, to help us with the uh, data. So uh, in particular, using data that has already been labeled, we will select the model P, we will find its parameters X, um, such that the output of the model matches essentially the data points that we know what their labels, label is. So in particular here, we have just linear classifying, uh, classifiers, just linear functions. Um, so we want to choose the best classifier on scene data on the training test by minimizing some uh, error measure that I will talk about in a moment. Um, in particular, what we would ideally like to, to solve is something that minimizes, for example, the average number of mistakes that we make. So P is the model um, and if y and p, if their product is negative, then I have misclassified the point. And so what I want is to, uh, to look at this indicator uh, function here and then look at its average over uh, the set. However, this uh, average uh, uses, uh, assumes that I would know uh, p, the measure p, but uh, usually the distribution of this point is unknown. So I cannot use this formulation to find my parameters for the best classifier. So what people typically use is empirical risk. Uh, that's, sorry, that's, the, that's, not the, uh, that's another um, simplification. Um, and sorry, not, uh, it's not uh, typically used, but some people use it. Um, so in empirical risk, what we uh, do is we uh, try to get rid of this problem of not knowing the distribution by just looking at the finite sum and um, looking at minimizing that uh, simple average over the number of mistakes. The problem still in this is that I have here a sum of indicator functions. So this is a non-smooth problem. And though in principle, you know, you could solve it, uh, and there are some approaches that look at this, in practice, we like smooth things in optimization. That's, that's best if one has them. Um, and so what happens is that this formulation here, this non-smooth formulation is smoothed out using some loss function. Um, so these step functions are smoothed out through a, through, through a loss. Um, and so we have both a sum here and we have uh, uh, replaced our one here by a smooth, uh, a smooth approximation of it so that we end up with the typical structure that we know a sum of functions. So our objective that we minimize to find the best parameters is a sum of functions, and there are a lot of them. That was the linear case. How about nonlinear? For example, uh, we have deep neural networks that are very powerful um, constructions. And again, we start with input U and the labels for, uh, so we start with data pairs, and what we have in DNNs is we no longer have um, linear models, but we have these compositions um, uh, of affine functions with nonlinear activations. So we have this uh, well-known uh, ReLU function or tan h for the choice of phi. And starting from the data points u, we are going to compose them um, in this way. Um, so we are going to construct this recursion that applies to, these are our parameters now, our unknown parameters we want to find to find the, uh, the best model. 
this matrix is AJ, the weight matrix is AJ, that are weighted by the uh, recursion on the data points, and then this bias is uh, BJ. And we apply, uh, we apply uh, the activation function to get the next uh, um, AJ, little AJ, and so on up until the last layer. So L is the last layer, um, and that's our model. So we have this, uh, this composition of functions and, and recursion up until the last layer. So the parameters we want to find here are these uh, matrices or entries of these matrices and, and uh, the biases. So we have a lot of parameters. Um, and again, we are going to do the same to P as before. We are going to um, smooth it out and look at the a finite sum over a large number of data points. And so to find the parameters, the weight matrices and the biases, we minimize the sum of functions, uh, sum of loss uh, terms, where the loss measures the discrepancy, it's an error measure between um, the value of the model at the data point UI and the observation of the labels uh, YI. So for example, this L can be a regression, uh, so it can be uh, a least squares type, uh, type loss or can be logistic regression or other type of, uh, of functions. Um, but what happens is that you, you do have a smooth function here and you measure somehow the error between the model and uh, the observations or the data uh, labels that you already have in the training. So it's, it's smooth, it has somewhat of a special structure and it's huge in both the number of uh, variables or parameters and the data points. In this uh, case, it is a deterministic formulation. So you do solve in the training a deterministic optimization problem. But what you really care about is an underlying stochastic uh, problem. Because what you would really like to minimize is the expected loss. Um, so also, uh, you want to do well on unseen data when you start doing the uh, prediction on uh, unknown data. And so underlying this deterministic formulation, there is a, a stochastic uh, problem that ideally one would like to solve. And what do people do? Well, stochastic gradient descent is the, uh, uh, the core uh, method that has been now improved quite a bit. I will hopefully get to that at the end of the talk. Um, but the fundamental aspect here is that you are going to do some kind of uh, an approximate gradient descent step um, where instead of taking all the sums, uh, all the functions in the sum, all the functions fi in the sum of functions in your objective, you are going to take a random subset of them and calculate the gradient just on those terms. So you're gonna, going to look at a subset of uh, the training data when you construct your uh, uh, step from some point xk. So to train, to find your parameters x, uh, x uh, you are going to iterate and find approximations xk, and that every iteration xk, you're going to generate the next point xk plus one by taking from xk this approximate uh, uh, negative uh, uh, gradient step, where the approximate gradient is a uh, constructed by just looking at a batch of the functions uh, fi of the data points, a random, a random batch. And you cut this direction by some learning rate, so-called the learning rate, a step size, as we call it in optimization, a line search. However, in machine learning, because it's expensive to evaluate uh, f or all of f, uh, what people do is use predefined step size alpha k. And a lot of effort goes into finding a good alpha k. So people usually either fix it at the start of the algorithm at the, of the training, or they use some kind of predefined uh, 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 sequence like one over k, uh, multiplied maybe by some constant that's to be, to be found. So there is a lot of tuning that goes on before running the, uh, the, uh, the algorithm to find this uh, learning rate. And we know in optimization, in classical optimization, we don't do that. We allow adaptivity in this choice of, uh, of, uh, of the learning rate. We allow it so that the algorithm can um, um, adapt to the local landscape and can get somehow um, a, a, a great local 
uh, descent at every uh, at every iteration, or at typically at every iteration. The other assumption here that's typically done is to assume that this batch gradient is an unbiased estimator of the true gradient. So this is an underlying assumption of most convergence uh, results and uh, for stochastic gradient, and it leads to uh, results that, uh, of convergence with positive probability. So also with positive probability, the algorithm can fail. Um, the other issues that are, occur are ill conditioning. It is a first order method, an approximate first order method. And so uh, we expect to see problems with uh, the negative gradient direction as we see in classical optimization with steepest descent. Um, and this leads to uh, getting solutions just with low uh, accuracy. The methods that we've um, spent time developing um, try to tackle the issue of scalability, the issue of adaptivity. Can we allow a, an adaptive choice of alpha k, but also of the batch size sk? Sk, the batch size, is also typically fixed. Um, can we do a variable batch size, and does that help? And it does. Um, the other issue is uh, curvature. Can we include some second order information? Can we allow bias instead of just unbiased estimator? And allowing these uh, more flexible choices, can we get better convergence results, in particular, almost sure convergence and complexity? All right, so to begin this uh, journey on some of these uh, works, I have to take a detour and talk about sketching. So sketching is a very useful tool. And uh, I was absolutely fascinated with this area. And uh, I, just, uh, I, just, I just love it, <laughs> sorry. So I, I, I learned a lot by looking at it. So I will try to share with you some of, uh, some of my understanding. It all starts with Johnson Lindenstrauss lemma. That's the core result. And it says that if S is a scaled Gaussian matrix, so, I, sorry, let me start. I have a vector x in Rn, and n, little n, is big. And what I do is I apply essentially a random matrix S to x, and I try to see if I can do it in a way that preserves the length of x. Now, uh, for this to give me anything in terms of dimensionality reduction to problems, S is an underdetermined matrix. So I'm trying to project x from a large dimension to a small dimension m. Okay, so if S is a scaled Gaussian matrix and the small dimension varies in this way, then S will be, will embed correctly the vector X. So it will approximately preserve its length. So you can see here that the distortion is just some epsilon S here, and we can choose uh, epsilon S. Choosing epsilon S here will of course, influence the size of S in the small dimension. So it will affect how uh, much I can project my vector. Okay. And this result is true with probability at least one minus delta S. But I want you to notice that this delta S appears in a log in the size of, of the matrix S. And so, in other words, this is a high probability result because I can replace here delta S by, some, by E to some mu. Um, so this is a high probability result. Um, and what we notice also is that uh, the big dimension n does not appear in the size of s, uh, in, the, in the small size of s. So in the projection size, it, do, is that it does not appear. And it also does not appear in the accuracy epsilon s. OK, so how do we understand briefly this result? So if my vector x was random, then how would I measure its length? I would just randomly subselect a few entries and measure the length of those entries and maybe do some rescaling. And indeed, in this plot here, you can see I plotted the norm of x uh, applied to x over the norm of x. And you can see that it is essentially concentrated around 1. Indeed, this is a, a, a concentration of measure. Uh, phenomena here. 
But what if X is deterministic? Well, I can transform it and then treat it like random. And the key is that the Ga a Gaussian matrix acts as both a transform and a sampler simultaneously. In other words, it's a random projection. So this is when I take one vector and I try to project it. Now, what if I have a subspace? So now I take a matrix A, that's N times D, and I look at the column space of A. So that is a subspace uh, of dimension at most D, but let's assume it's, it's D. And now I want to project every vector in this column space. Can I do this while preserving its length? Yes. Again, if S is a scaled uh, Gaussian matrix of the right size, small dimension M here, then I can achieve this with high probability. And what we notice about the size of S is that now it depends on D. It's proportional to D, but it still doesn't depend on the large dimension N. And indeed, we notice this uh, phase transitions that occur. So here in these plots, uh, uh, at the bottom of the slide, I plot um, uh, the size of M over D and on the horizontal axis, and vertically I plot um, the norm of uh, SAY. So the norm of the... Um, no. Sorry. Um, so I plot... Sorry, I plot... Vamos a ir hoy, so, so, on, so on the horizontal axis, I uh, have um, M over D, and on the vertical uh, axis, I plot, sorry, the true, um, the true um, uh, residual. And what we see, what we see is that uh, we have, mm -hmm. um, sorry, I plot the, the scaled residual. And what we see is that it's large up until M is about D, and then it, it decreases, uh, um, it gets very small. In other words, I uh, have a very good uh, error once M is about D. So I, this property is true once M is about D, but it's not true if M is, of course, less than D. And that's, one can show that rigorously as well. And this is for various uh, random matrices A. All right, so I can reduce I can reduce my dimension of the subspace from uh, something that is in Rn to something that is proportional uh, to D. But the problem is that when S is a Gaussian matrix, forming S times A has N in it, has the big dimension, it's expensive. So what people have done is to look at sparse random uh, embeddings. The simplest sparse uh, uh, matrix S is when you randomly would subselect rows of A. So if I tell you, look, I'm giving you a matrix A that has a lot of rows, just try to find out a smaller matrix that, that would uh, have enough information in a random way, you would probably think, okay, let's just subselect some of the rows. However, the problem is that if the rows are of very different magnitudes, you may miss when you do that an important row. And so sampling is not uh, a typically a, a sparse, uh, is not a subspace embedding, does not have uh, sparse embedding properties unless all the rows of A are of similar magnitude. And this is captured in a notion called uh, low coherence. So if, uh, if, you, if A has this property, then you can show embedding properties for sampling matrices. Otherwise, they don't have these properties. So in sampling, uh, so S has, in other words, a non one non-zero per row. It turns out that if you take one non-zero per column in S, you get a matrix with much better subspace embedding properties. So where it has this kind of johnston linden strauss properties. Um, this makes a big difference because once you start having one non-zero per row, you may have more than one non-zero Sorry, per, once you have one non-zero per column, you start having more uh, non-zeros per row. And in other words, when you construct S times A, you will touch every row of A and you will consider, for example, sums of two rows. And this is much more robust. 
and it was found numerically to be as good as the Gaussian. However, the theoretical properties um, uh, quantifying the size of M were not as good as for Gaussian. And what we managed to do is to come up with some uh, uh, results that show, that, that try to capture this good behavior similar to uh, Gaussian matrices. So we were able to show that if you have these good sparse random matrices called hashing or count sketch, then indeed it's enough to have M proportional to D um, to get uh, a subspace embedding, of course, still for matrices A with uh, low coherence. So this is better than sampling. It is sparse and it tries to, it, it has a similar behavior numerically to Gaussian uh, matrices. Where am I going with all this? So let's go back now, finish our detour and go back to optimization. So now I want to show you that in fact, you can view stochastic gradient and other and, sub, and, and subspace methods as uh, using sketching. And indeed they do use sketching. So when we have, uh, let's take SK for this slide to be a sampling matrix. So I have one non-zero per row. So remember, this is not a very good random uh, matrix. Um, we could do sketching for our problem, for our sum of functions, for example, fi, in the data points, in the observational domain. And I want to show you that stochastic gradient can be viewed as doing exactly that. So I have my sum of functions. And when I construct my stochastic gradient direction, what I do is I randomly subselect sk of these fi functions. But when I construct this sum, uh, this subset of the fi's, all I'm doing is I'm looking at a big vector f of all the uh, functions fi in my sum of functions that I use in my training. So I look at all that vector and I randomly subselect some of them. That's the same as applying a sampling matrix sk to this vector f. And then what I do is I take in the stochastic gradient, I take, uh, I take, a, uh, I take the gradient of this subsampled uh, uh, objective. So stochastic gradient underly underlying it, it's doing a sketching in the observational domain using a sampling matrix. You can also think here of linear, uh, doing sketching in linearly squares, non-linearly squares and getting some, uh, get is that, that's what's commonly done uh, and if you want to do some kind of, obtain some kind of stochastic algorithm for nonlinear uh, least squares. Now, if we look at, sorry, I should say that for linear least squares, uh, a lot of work has been done by the randomized numerical linear algebra community using sketching for linear least squares, but this is beyond the scope uh, here. Now, we can use uh, sketching also in the variable domain. And if SK is a sampling matrix, that gives rise to random block coordinate methods. So you can view random block coordinate methods as applying SK is SK throughout this talk is an underdetermined sketching matrix. So what I do is I apply its transpose to uh, new variables Y. So X is SK transpose Y. I look at it that way. And when SK has one non-zero per, per row, this gives rise to random block coordinate methods using uh, sampling matrix. And what both of these sets of, uh, 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 both of, these sets of methods, what they uh, have as, as a convergence result is in expectation with positive probability for a fixed uh, batch size SK here or, or for a fixed block size for uh, coordinate descent. Can we do better? Can we get better convergence results, like I was saying, with uh, um, uh, probability one? And what we saw from the sketching results I presented is that sampling is not such a good matrix, a uh, random projector. Um, other, other sketching matrices uh, would be uh, better and would they give us better results? So I will try to answer this in, uh, in, the, in this uh, next part. So I will talk just about uh, reducing the dimension of uh, the uh, parameter space, so reducing the dimension of the variable space. Um, I will not talk here about uh, cutting from the other side. So I will not talk so much about 
stochastic gradient uh, variance yet. So, okay, so let me explain. Random subspace methods. I, as I said, I'm a mathematician, so I like to abstract. So I'm gonna step back a little bit here. And because I'm just cutting the dimension of the variables X of the parameters X, I'm just looking at that problem. I can just consider here an objective F. The sum of functions uh, structure is relevant if I look at sketching just in the observational domain. So I can just treat some function F here and I'm gonna consider a generic algorithm that generates iterates, optimization algorithm that generates iterates XK. And what we typically do in optimization is to approximate our complicated function f locally around xk by some model, local model, local Taylor-like model. So when I have the full gradient of f, for example, I can consider this model here. This is the usual full dimensional model. So I have the gradient here, and here I have some matrix bk that tries to contain curvature. If bk is zero, there is no bk, then when I try to find my direction that minimizes this local model, I just get the negative gradient descent. If I have BK, for example, to be the second derivative matrix of F, then I would get the Newton direction. So this is something that's, that can be first order, second order, anything. But it's full dimensional because S lies in Rn, the big dimension N. So what I will do is I will sketch the direction S. So what I'm trying to do is when I calculate S to work in a subspace, in a random subspace. And for that, I will replace S by SK transpose S hat, where SK is still a sketching matrix, M times N, underdetermined. So when I replace S by that in the model, I get something like this, where S hat now lies in RM, where M is the small dimension. And using transposition properties, I have here the projection the sketch of the gradient of F. That's the crucial thing here. And here I have some reduced uh, uh, approximate uh, curvature matrix. But the key thing here that I care about for convergence is this term. So in the reduced domain, I have here the projection of the gradient. In particular, there are ways that I can uh, do this so that I do not actually compute the gradient. So this will allow me not to compute the full gradient but just to compute a sketch of it, even in its calculation. So both I solved in a reduce, I solve for S in a reduced uh, subspace, and also I do not need to calculate the full gradient, just its projection. Of course, in an optimization algorithm, we have other ingredients. We have to make sure we converge from any starting point. Um, and so for that, we need to include a learning rate, we need to include a line search, we need to include a trust region if we don't, want line search or regularization term and so on. So these are safeguarding mechanisms that we don't need to worry about uh, here. So in such an optimization algorithm where at each iteration, I'm going to draw a random matrix and solve a reduced local model, calculate a direction in the reduced space and then project back into the full space, okay? With some safeguarding, the question is, when does this algorithm converge? And under what conditions? On the, on the, uh, under what conditions? So these are my two conditions. It turns out that I only need to uh, capture correctly the length of the gradient. Indeed, I need that the sketched gradient is lower bounded by a multiple of the true gradient with some probability. So in fact, I only need a one-sided of my sketching condition. We recognize here that this is just my johnson linder strauss condition. It's just my random matrix preserves length, um, um, random projection preserves length uh, condition, just one side of it, and just for one vector, for the gradient. In other words, all I need here is that uh, S case is uh, embedding correctly a subspace of dimension one vectors, essentially. I also need that the sketch is bounded uh, above uniformly uh, with a certain uh, probability. I need to be a little bit careful with the update of the state parameters in the algorithm. I cannot do it too fast or too slow. 
to um, be able to uh, make good progress. But we can do that uh, in the algorithm. Um, these are this is all things that are implementable. And what can we show if the underlying problem f is smooth, Lipschitz continuous gradient? That's all. Then a random subspace trust region line search or regularization approach um, will ensure will will have almost sure convergence. And furthermore, we can quantify its complexity with exponentially high probability. The algorithm will take order epsilon to minus two iterations to drive the true gradient below epsilon. This complexity bound here is uh, matching in the order of epsilon is matching uh, deterministic uh, uh, derivative based methods, um, typical bound for, for first order uh, non-convex uh, optimization uh, algorithms. So this complexity of, uh, of uh, methods that have full derivatives changes in this case just by a constant multiple that depends on how often do I see, um, um, on, on, that depends on the success probability delta S of the sketch. How often do I see an accurate uh, gradient? Okay, so now this is reassuring. We have gone from a method like block coordinates that has just convergence typically with positive probability to something that has almost sure convergence under mild assumptions. So I want to talk for another moment about these assumptions. What choice of SK will ensure this condition? I have already said that SK here just needs to embed the correctly gradients, okay? And that means from the first slide on sketching that I will have no ambient dimension dependence if SK is a, a, a good matrix like a scale Gaussian. But also my subspace uh, uh, dimension is one because I only embed, need to embed correctly the gradient. And so the size of S can be, is independent of, of big N of, of anything. It's just some constants that depend on the accuracy of the sketch epsilon S, but this can be like a half and on uh, the success probability for the sketch. So this is from JL Lemma here and the same for hashing. So in other words, I can have random subspace methods. This is what we have here, a random subspace method that uh, can choose the block size to be small and can ensure almost sure convergence. Now, what happens if I choose SK to be a sampling matrix? Then I have problems because we saw that sampling could miss important entries. So if my gradient vector has some entries that are very large, then a sampling matrix could miss those and then um, could fail. So it, it, it is not really uh, possible in general to prove uh, almost sure convergence unless you make some assumptions on F. Indeed, if you assume that, that uh, the gradient is somehow has low coherence, so all its entries are similar in magnitude, then you can show that block coordinates um, um, in this framework also work with almost short convergence. But you can see here in these results, the discrepancy between having a good embedding and having a poor embedding. And sampling is really very um, uh, uh, ubiquitously used. However, there are uh, better approaches. So let me try to say a little bit more as to what are the key ingredients here in, for these methods to work. What does this rely on? Essentially, it relies on the fact that we take classical frameworks. So in this um, random uh, uh, subspace method that I've just uh, mentioned, where we'll use these uh, subspace uh, models and sketching uh, to, to find the direction, um, in these algorithms, we do have adaptive parameters. So the safeguards, the trust region, the learning rate, um, or the regularization, they have to be allowed to vary in the algorithm. And they adjust, uh, they allow us to recover from poor situations, basically. Um, and in other words, what we are doing here is we are taking a classical 
optimization framework, like line search trust region. And inside that, with some care, we are just calculating a, re a randomly uh, reduced direction. And so the question we are, uh, we are in fact answering is how much inaccurate information can a classical optimization algorithm tolerate? And this goes back to this theory of probabilistic models used in uh, some optimization uh, papers. And what we have is that when you have this sketching of the direction, um, we are getting a good, a sufficiently good direction with a certain probability. But on the other iterations where the sketch is bad, where the sketch is not working, um, the direction can be arbitrarily bad, okay? So the step is good with a certain probability or sufficiently good and bad otherwise. So automatically in these frameworks, you're allowing bias. You're not asking that, you know, the expected value of your sketch gradient, for example, matches the true gradient. No, you are allowing errors there. And um, you're allowing that when things go bad, they can go arbitrarily bad. However, the adaptivity in the algorithm parameters allow us to come out of those situations, to adapt and come out of them. Um, and of course, you need to see a good step frequent enough. But as long as you see it more than half the time, uh, you're good. So that is, these are the, the, key, the key ingredients here. I will skip this so that I can give a bit more about the proof, but um, I can answer questions for those that are interested. So I want to uh, now just very briefly uh, show some um, numerical uh, results where we use a regression uh, framework. Um, and what we have is uh, we use logistic regression for some uh, data set. And what we can see in this plot, we have a Gauss-Newton type. Um, um, so we, we solve uh, least squares with second order information as well. And what we find here is that in purple here um, is our ideal full dimensional uh, method. And in these, all these other colors, we have um, like uh, block coordinates on this Gauss-Newton framework where we, use, where we use curvature. And in iterations, we don't gain anything. However, when you look at runtime, we gain a lot compared to the purple line, which is the full dimensional model. And that's kind of a typical um, behavior when it works uh, well. And uh, similarly here, the full dimensional in runtime is much slower than the block method. And that's very much the uh, aim. So I've talked about uh, how to randomly uh, reduce the dimension of the parameter space in each iteration of a say a training algorithm. Um, and you can use that more broadly for any uh, optimization uh, uh, problem that's small, um, but where you don't necessarily see uh, accurate derivatives. Um, we have extensions here. Um, there is a vast literature on how to sketch in the observational domain, how to get uh, good batch methods or subsampling uh, methods. And I don't have uh, time to talk about this uh, here really. Uh, you get stochastic optimization algorithms and um, typical frameworks also will involve some of these probabilistic models uh, there as well. I want to talk for a few minutes, if, if, my, if I'm uh, allowed, about random subspace methods for global optimization. Okay, so I want to say now because in global optimization, we have such problem with scalability of methods. Um, I want to see, can I use some of these random projections to allow me better scalability for global optimization problems? I will tie it to machine learning in a few slides, okay? So let me uh, just uh, say that I'm thinking now, can I do, you know, can I randomly reduce the dimension of my uh, variables X in a generic optim a global optimization problem with F being smooth, can I just reduce it randomly and I keep changing the random uh, projection to get uh, a scale better scalability? So F is black box. Indeed, so let now SK is Gaussian. I cannot do this for anything but Gaussian here. So 
I am at iteration k. I'm, I'm iteration is ill defined here. I I just have uh, I start. I draw a random subspace and then um, I solve my problem globally in the subspace in the reduced subspace. So I apply any global optimization algorithm in this random subspace. I'm also allowing that once I've solved in that subspace, then I find the best point in the subspace globally, and then I move to that point, okay? That becomes my anchor point, my base point at the next iteration. And at that point, I draw another random subspace, and I globally minimize my function f in that subspace. This is like a random search method but it's in a subspace instead of just along one direction for now. Okay, so can we quantify the convergence here? If F is just Lipschitz continuous, I solve accurately enough in each subspace and my, ba my base points, my anchor points where, I'm, where I draw my random subspace can be randomly chosen or fixed or chosen as the best point I found so far, like I was saying earlier. Then what we can show is that with probability one, so again, almost sure convergence, these best points found in each subspace will enter an epsilon neighborhood of a global minimizer uh, with probability one. To prove this, we use tools from conic integral geometry, which it turns out that what we need to quantify is the probability of success that a random subspace at a point drawn at the point P will intersect a ball, an epsilon ball of a global minimizer. And that can be translated into a question of when does the cone generated by this ball, circular cone generated by this uh, ball of the epsilon minimizer um, and a random subspace drawn at the same point share a ray? This is a question that it turns out people in conic integral geometry have answered, in stochastic geometry have answered for us. So we use the results from that uh, community to prove this almost sure convergence. What we found, of course, is something for a general F that depends on the big dimension N exponentially because global optimization is NP hard. This bound though is better than what you would get with uniform sampling. So we have in some cases of interest that this bound is better. Okay, so this is maybe not a big deal. So we can get, do this, we can get almost sure convergence. It's a better version of uh, random search, uh, better bound with new tools. However, when is this useful? Random subspace methods are actually very good for a certain subclass of functions, namely for functions that have low effective dimensionality. So I want uh, you to have in mind this sinusoidal curve. So this is a function um, um, that surface, sinusoidal surface. So, so what we do is, you, if you look at it, you see that this function only varies along this direction and it's constant along orthogonal directions to uh, uh, this direction of variation. So in other words, its dimension, its true dimension where anything happens from an optimization point of view is one and in the other direction, nothing happens. So when you apply a random subspace framework to this problem, you can get rid of the large dimension. So indeed, for such functions, I will have a subspace of minimizers, of global minimizers, at least one. I will have at least one subspace of global minimizers. So then if I draw a random subspace and I try to solve my problem just in that random subspace globally, what I see that with probability one, this random subspace will intersect this line, global line of minimizers because I have more minimizers. And, and so with probability one, the random subspace will intersect it. And so provided my random subspace is at least of dimension, the same dimension as my effective dimension of my function, um, I solve in just one random subspace, I solve my problem globally and I'm done. So I only need one random embedding to find the global, a global uh, minimizer of this uh, function. This is in the unconstrained case. 
Indeed. And this is in the case when I know a bound, at least on the effective dimension of my function. My function f could be black box. Of course, if I know the effective uh, subspace itself, then it's trivial. But if I don't know the effective subspace and I just do random projections, as long as I know its dimension, I'm, I need one embedding. If I don't know its dimension, I can just start with a small dimension and keep increasing it and just solve in a finite number of subspaces. Again, uh, convergence with probability one. Uh, indeed, so, so in other words, what we have here, and I'm running out of time, I'm, I'm conscious of this, so I want to finish very uh, shortly. What we have here is that uh, for these functions, the complexity goes from NP hard to actually something uh, uh, in the small dimension DE, in this effective dimension. So we can get rid of the ambient uh, dimension and we can get scalable methods. And uh, the, the scalability of these methods in this case do not vary with the growing ambient dimension of the problem. And we are able to show this very rigorously, theoretically and numerically. And we even looked at using local methods in each subspace, um, and that also uh, works well. So what's the connection to machine learning here? Well, this proposal of uh, using random inventing to scale methods was first done by um, uh, Wang and the Fretas and others uh, in the context of Bayesian optimization to uh, help scale Bayesian optimization algorithms. Um, there were various congestions that were uh, made in that paper that we were able to answer and improve upon. Also, um, it was uh, this kind of approach was recommended in the paper of Bengio for you for uh, to be used for uh, hyperparameter tuning in uh, deep learning. And it was conjectured in these papers that the landscape of uh, uh, deep nets, because deep nets are very overparameterized um, problems. And um, these kind of structures of low effective dimension are especially encountered where we have overparameterized models, because then when we have too many, too much, uh, when we have uh, too many uh, uh, parameters, we expect that the model will not be sensitive to changes in some of them. And as long as this insensitivity is, is, is linear, then this framework would apply, or approximately linear even. Um, and indeed, it was conjectured that uh, the, 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 the training of the landscape of the training problem, the optimization uh, training problem in deep nets has some kind of structures because people have observed these kind of values of solutions. Um, and indeed, people have done random subspace projections to the parameters uh, of, a, of, of deep nets so that you, you solve with far less parameters, you just solve once. And it seemed to work very well. So there are these papers out there. Um, and people couldn't quite explain why. And what we were trying to do with this work is also to give an explanation to this kind of uh, phenomena. And there are more and more papers coming out of that, uh, of that, uh, that try to find out what is the true dimension of the uh, training uh, uh, objective landscape. Um, I will stop here. Uh, what I wanted, um, sorry. Can, can I have one or one minute or so just to round up things? Sorry, I couldn't hear. One minute for you? Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, another big dis discussion is uh, between first and second order methods in machine learning and what is uh, good there. Um, and this is um, with, um, so, for example, Adam is now very much uh, the choice for training deep nets, um, and Adam tries to get some curvature information into stochastic gradient in a cheap way. And what we tried to do was to improve on Adam. There are also other methods that use, um, so I won't have time to go through these numerics, but let me just say in words. So, so there are various versions of Adam that try to have some simple curvature in. There are now another class of methods coming out that are Gauss-Newton type methods. KFAC, SANG, uh, that have much more curvature in them and that are now starting to beat Adam. Um, so this is, uh, there is still uh, um, work there, but it's actually very hard to make uh, uh, second order methods work well for machine learning. You really have to look at the architecture. You really have to optimize on the architecture to be able to beat uh, Adam in terms of time. 
um, because of course second order is more is more computationally expensive. Okay, so um, I hope I gave you a flavor of some of my uh, recent research that was very much motivated by machine learning applications and the challenges that come to us in optimization from that uh, area. As a mathematician, I try to pose these questions uh, a bit more generally and try, try to answer more general questions, but hopefully with applicability to these uh, areas as well. And it's not really fair to say that, you know, we, in optimization, we help data science. It's also the other way around. I've learned a lot from randomized numerical uh, linear algebra techniques, from statistics. Uh, we use tools that then help improve optimization algorithms, uh, not just for these applications, but uh, more uh, generally. And I owe my thanks to, to many people, including my students and postdocs from whom I've learned a lot. And also I now always thank the referees because, uh, sorry, as, a, as an editor, I, I um, I really uh, have uh, uh, very much appreciated the efforts that go behind the scenes. And it's, it's such a crucial aspect of our community that, that this work um, uh, goes on so anonymously. So maybe sometimes not appreciated enough. So I would just like to thank uh, in general to all referees, not just for my papers, but just, just generally. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your very insightful talk, Coralia. And I think we have time for questions from the audience here. Is there any hand? That's one. Good morning. Thanks for the very interesting talk. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. I understand that all this analysis is valid for the training uh, part of the uh, uh, system. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And so how does this knowledge of, uh, you know, guarantees for convergence, et cetera, uh, can be helpful to understand the generalization properties of these uh, neural networks? Okay, so, so, so this is a very good question and I have not uh, really uh, talked about here. So when I was saying that what we really would like to solve is to minimize the expected value, of uh, of uh, this uh, of this uh, loss uh, functions, um, so I can recommend to you some papers that essentially you have to go to stochastic optimization. So what I talked about here, because I talked about how to reduce the number of parameters, essentially the key thing is that the objective is still you are able to evaluate it. Okay, so in all this framework, you are able to fully evaluate the objective function. Um, if you want to uh, care what happens in the training and the generalization as well, you have to look at the stochastic case. And, um, and that is something that, so essentially then you look at all these approaches that sketch in the observational domain. So that's kind of the same thing that maybe it's not obvious that it is, but uh, it can be phrased in this way. Um, and so essentially you have to go to stochastic optimization. And these kind of ideas of probabilistic models and so on, they have also been done in that context. So I can recommend uh, some papers of um, uh, Katja Scheinberg. I also have some papers there um, where we look at complexity and convergence when you have a stochastic objective. So you don't evaluate F exactly. And then you can uh, phrase that. But what we have not done is to quantify precisely the trade-off between the training error and the generalization error. So we, we have not looked at that. We just have looked at how to solve an optimization problem efficiently with strong guarantees of convergence. Um, and what happens if that objective is also stochastic, then can you, what can you do? What can you guarantee? And you can guarantee similar things. Um, but this trade-off of precise quantification, like some of the, um, some other people have, uh, there's quite a bit of work on, you know, if you stop the stochastic gradient at some point and it leaves you some error, then how do you count, uh, use that as kind of to precondition uh, um, or use, sorry, use that, let me, um, so, so that error, um, where should you stop, right? So that you don't uh, just solve within noise 
but then the error acts as a sort of a regularization on your solution and helps you find a robust solution to generalization error. So we have not looked at that kind of work, but there is quite a lot of work on that. Okay, thank you. And I have another question in machine yeah. learning. There's another place where uh, random subspaces have been very helpful. That's random forests, for instance. Okay, okay. Uh, can you uh, carry out some similar analysis for random forests or has that been already uh, been considered in the literature? Okay, so that's a very good question. Thank you. So we have not looked at that, but that would be a very good thing for us to try to apply these frameworks to. Thank you. So I have not, that's a more discrete approach. So we have not, uh, we, all we have looked at is kind of continuous optimization formulations. But if you go to more discrete approaches, um, th then we have not looked at that, but that, that is actually a very, very interesting point. But I don't I, know how much has been done from other directions there, uh, but I would, that, that's a very good idea. Actually, I think you can also do this for boosting, uh, you know, like stream boosting type of machines. I think that's mm -hmm. continuous, not so discrete. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your point, Teresa, as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. And next time, see you face to face. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and I may see you online a, a bit later. And thank you again for for the invitation and for everything. Have a good rest of the conference. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.